she told me, she came into the room while I was preparing this and says, well, do you have any pictures? Do you have any pretty slides? Do you have any good questions or anything? Oh, I said, no, I just have scriptures. And she says, well, it's going to be boring. You're going to lose people. <laughs> and so here you go. Here's your pretty slide. Paul. I want you to remember that, Paul. Now if I can get off that screen. There we go. For behold, in those days, this is Joel 3, verses 1 through 3. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, and as I've pointed out many times here, I hope you never forget, the, th the second chapter, the end of the second chapter, are those things that we know as the church age, predicted by Joel, repeated by Peter on the day of Pentecost, and he says, this is what you're looking at. Well, it, then Joel goes on to say, for behold, okay, based on this, or this is the cause of it, look, in those days, in the church age, and at that time, when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem, I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Okay, I'm introducing a new color, green. Okay, and I've talked to you before about this, and I'm going to give a little bit more evidence about this today. Jehoshaphat was the name of a king in Judah. A lot of people think it is a place in Jerusalem, though there's always a question mark. They can't find the valley of Jehoshaphat. Some people will tell you it's a valley that's also known as Kidron outside Jerusalem. Why do they say that? Because it says he's going to gather them to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I don't think that's what he's talking about. We run into problems with Revelation when it says he's going to gather them into Armageddon, which would be the hill of Megiddo, which is a long ways from Jerusalem if you have to walk it. I think that he's using these names because of their meaning. Jeho. Jehovah, Shaphat, judgment, the valley of God's judgment, and I will enter into judgment. Guess what? That green word there is Shaphat, the second word in the combined two words that make up the name Jehosh or Jehoshaphat with them there on account of my people my heritage israel whom they have scattered among the nations they have also divided up my land did the united nations make a decree in the middle of the last century about the dividing of palestine <coughs> a two-state solution you ever heard of that they have cast lots for my people, have given a boy as payment for a harlot, and sold a girl for wine that they might drink. Now we jump down further in the text. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come, all you nations, and gather together around. Cause your mighty ones to go down there. Oh, I have a little purple letter there, because I want you to note that it says, Cause your mighty ones to go down there, O Lord. Well, you got two possibilities here, that he's just saying that all of the armies of the mighty ones of God, they're tools that he's going to use, or that God has some other mighty ones that are gonna come down and get involved in this. Thus the purple. Let the nations be awakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat for, because there I will sit to judge. Yes, Shaphat, the last half of that name. All the surrounding nations put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. I could have made that another color because those of you who are fairly familiar with the book of Revelation, especially in the 14th chapter, should recognize the concept of put in the sickle for the harvest is ripe. 
Come, go down, for the wine press is full, the fats overflow. So put that in your memory bank. See if we don't hear that more. For their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and moon will grow dark and the stars will diminish their brightness. See if we don't see something more about that. The book of Jeremiah. And I would have loved to have read the entire 25th chapter of Jeremiah for you, but I didn't think I had the time to do it and do it justice. So I'm going to tell you what happens in the first part of the chapter. It happens in the 23rd year of Jeremiah as a prophet. He says, I've been hearing from God about you people for 23 years, and you haven't listened to anything that I've told you. And so the predictions that have been made about you are going to happen. And he tells them how that Babylon is going to come down and take them captive and the nations around them. And so we pick it up at that point in verse 12. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation. So not just the king, but the people of the nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquities, says the Lord. Or says Yahweh. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. Otherwise, it would go on that way forever. So I will bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. Now, if we stop here, if you know much about history in the city of Babylon, it wasn't destroyed right away. It went on for hundreds of years. Alexander the Great made it his capital, moved his mother there. It was a condo or adult living, I don't know. But he moved to there. But it did eventually go away, the city of Babylon. But it took a long time to do it. All that is written in this book, which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. For many nations and great kings shall be served by them also. Yeah, a lot of nations and kings came up against Babylon. And I will repay them according to their deeds and according to the works of their own hands. For thus says the Lord God of Israel to me, Take this wine cup of fury from my hand. So it's God's cup full of his wrath. It says, take this from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad. Blue letters. Remember the blue letters that we had in Zechariah 14? What would happen to the donkeys and the mules and the people that were riding on them? Okay. And it's because of the sword that I will send among them, it says. Then I took the cup from the Lord's hand and made all the nations drink to whom the Lord had sent me. Now I have to pause here to say, I have no proof that Jeremiah actually went all over the planet. I don't know if there's enough time in his life to go to all the places or rather, this was just part of the vision that he was seeing, that he was foretelling to Jerusalem. But I can't deny the possibility that he actually went there. Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. So we have the colon at the end of verse 17. To whom the Lord has sent me. Colon. First city, Jerusalem. And the cities of Judah. Its kings, plural. It's princes, plural. So I want you to see this because this covers more time than just one little section of their history where there was one king. To make them a desolation, okay? An astonishment, a hissing, and a curse as it is to this day. Semicolon. 
You know what a semicolon is? It's a really, really big comma. It's used in a list where you talk a long time and then you go to the next thing. That's what a semicolon is. So what these translators did is said, okay, that's the first thing that he's listing. Next thing, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, his servants, his princes, and all his people, semicolon. All the mixed multitude, all the kings of the land of us, that's where Job was from, all the kings of the land of the Philistines, namely Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron, and the remnant of Ashdod, there's another group, semicolon. All the nations that surrounded the nation of Israel immediately. You put Israel right here, dink, 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 all around them. Okay. <laughs> Next, Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon, semicolon. All the kings of Tyre. How many kings of Tyre were there? All the kings of Sidon, and the kings of the coastlands which are across the sea. Dedan, Tima, Buzz, and all who are in the farthest corners. All the kings of Arabia, all the kings of the mixed multitude who dwell in the desert, all the kings of Zimri, all the kings of Elam, all the kings of the Medes, all the kings of the north, far and near, one with another, and all the kingdoms of the world which are on the face of the earth. <coughs> also the king of Shishak shall drink after them. Shishak is a code word for Babylon. Find that further on in the book of Jeremiah. Going on. Therefore you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. We talked a week or so ago in a built lesson about that phrase, Lord of hosts. Jehovah of armies. This is what he says. Drink, be drunk, and vomit. Fall, and rise no more. Because of the sword which I will send among you. And it shall be if they refuse to take the cup from your hand to drink, then you shall say to them, Thus says Jehovah of armies, you shall certainly drink. For behold, because, pay attention, I begin to bring calamity on the city which is called by my name, Jerusalem. And should you utterly be unpunished? Yeah, if Jerusalem is his people and his capital city, and if they're going to get in trouble, and if they're going to be punished, why would any other capital city on this planet think that it should get away with what it's done? Remember what we read in the adult lesson. Those that honor me, I will honor. And those who don't, I will esteem lightly, or I will consider them as nothing. Therefore prophesy against them all these words, verse 30, and say to them, Yahweh will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation. He will roar mightily against his fold. He will give a shout as those who tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. A noise will come to the ends of the earth, for Jehovah has a controversy with the nations. He will plead, remember what was in green? Jehoshaphat, Shaphat, I will judge, same word. I will plead his case with all flesh, he will give those who are wicked to the sword, says the Lord. And that I haven't read because I want you to know he isn't going to do this to the righteous. He's going to do this to those who refuse him. Thus says Yahweh of armies. 
Behold, disaster shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great whirlwind. And this is one of the texts I said I used in that sermon called The Winds of War. A great whirlwind shall be raised up from the farthest parts of the earth, and at that day the slain of Yahweh shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, nor gathered, or buried, but they shall become refuse on the ground. So now we change to Isaiah. Chapter 34, verses 1 through 4. Come near, you nations, to hear, and heed, you people. Let the earth hear, and all that is in it, the world and all things that come from it. So, what does that leave out? For the indignation of the Lord is against all nations, and his fury against all their armies. He has utterly destroyed them. He has given them over to the slaughter. Also their slain shall be thrown out, their stench shall rise from their corpses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. All the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. All their host shall fall down as the leaf falls from the vine, and as the fruit falling from a fig tree. Before we read on here, I'm not going to turn to it, but I want to remind you of Revelation chapter 12, where it says, And I saw war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but could not prevail, and there was no place found for them in heaven anymore. There's going to be further proof of what I'm going to say here down in the text a little further before after I turn the page here. But I want you to think about this. The stars of heaven, the hosts of heaven are the people who are now in control of this planet. And we could have a whole nother sermon filled with the information that we have in the Old Testament that tells us this. So when he's talking about the host of heaven, he's not talking about the various planets that are way out there and other galaxies going away. He's talking about the stars, the people who are the rulers now going away. But this heaven is going to be dissolved. The situation that we have now where this planet is ruled by corrupt people People looking to embetter themselves, to empower themselves, is going to go away. The heavens shall be rolled up like a scroll. It's going away. All their hosts shall fall down. How? He uses his poetic language. As the leaf falls from the vine, and as fruit falling from a fig tree. And how do we know that that's what he's talking about? Because we go on to read in the text, as we turn the page, for because my sword shall be bathed in heaven. Think about the Lord's Prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Is there war in the presence of God? No. He controls everything in his presence. We're not talking about that. What he's saying is, those things I said before, they're happening because my sword will be bathed in the heavens, referring to it's going to strike the leaders of this world. Those ones who come up against me and say, we will not do your will. We will do our will. Indeed, it shall come down on Edom. Is Edom in heaven? 
and on the people of my curse for, guess what, Shaphat. Now, some of you will go, no, that, that's what I looked it up. In my little Bible concordance, it says it's a different word. Well, this is where you got to do the work because it's from the root word, Shaphat. The sword of the Lord is filled with blood. It is made overflowing with fatness. Didn't we read about the put in the sickle for the wine press is ready? It's full of fat. With the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys of rams, for the Lord has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom. The wild oxen shall come down with them, and the young bulls with the mighty bulls. Their land shall be soaked with blood, and their dust saturated with fatness. So is it going to happen in Megiddo? Is it going to happen in Jehoshaphat? Or is it going to happen in Edom? Yes. Because they're all part of the same region. <clears throat> For it is the day of the Lord's vengeance, the year of the recompense for the cause of Zion. Revelation 6. Now, earlier in Revelation 6, you have seals 1, 2, 3, and 4, which kind of just tells you that the church age starts, and it starts off pretty good, and then it kind of goes sour. Sour to the point where they tell the people of the world, start killing his people. And he says he sees... The people that are slain, laying below the altar. So that's where we pick up. He opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And I would suggest to you that this isn't much different than how he, he doesn't feel much different about this than he does about the people that come up against Jerusalem or Israel. They fought against his people in the church age. They fight against his people. They cried with a loud voice, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. I believe that this is indicating that it was going to be a very dark day, and I'm not talking about literally the sun becoming dark. I'm not saying God couldn't do that. I'm saying what it's saying is, Things are going to get very bad for the world very quickly. Their days will be darkness and their nights will be bloody. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth. Notice how this sounds just like what Isaiah said in 34. As a fig drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. The kings of the earth are coming down. Then the sky receded as a scroll and is rolled up, just like Isaiah 34 said, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. That doesn't mean that the continents had to be moved. It doesn't mean that God couldn't do that. I'm not saying he couldn't. I'm saying that the world as we know it, with its governments as we know it, will stop. And that's why Revelation 11 says, verse 15, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Right? <laughs> then the sky receded as a scroll and is rolled up, and every mountain island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men. Now we go to the other end of the spectrum, every slave every free man so who's left if you have every king every great man the rich men the commanders the mighty men every slave and every free man who's left out of that list 
hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and he is able to stand. Isaiah 51. Awake, stand up, O Jerusalem. You have drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. You have drunk the dregs of the cup of trembling and drained it out. That's what he says to Jerusalem. Remember Jeremiah 25 said it was starting at Jerusalem. There is no one to guide her among all her sons. She is brought forth. No, nor is there any who takes her by the hand among all her sons. She is brought up. These two things have come to you. Who will be sorry for you? Desolation and destruction, famine and sword. By whom will I comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all streets like an antelope in a net. They are full of the fury of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, please hear this, you afflicted and drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord God, the Lord of your God, or the Lord and your God which is a good argument right here for why they shouldn't change it from the proper name of God, because it doesn't really make sense to say it over and over again, does it? Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, your God, who pleads the cause of his people. See, I have taken out of your hand the cup of trembling, the dregs of the cup of my fury. You shall no longer drink it, but I will put it into the hand of those who afflict you, who have said to you, Lie down, that we may walk over you, and you have laid your body like the ground, as the street for those who walked over you. So what's the cause? The way that the other nations have treated his people. In the Old Testament, it was Israel. In the New Testament, it's still Israel and the church. Read quickly here. Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Now we understand this to be Christ. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, remember in Joel it said, God, call down your mighty ones. Clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who work, worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse, and all the birds were filled with their flesh. I had to end with one. <laughs> Paul. So which horse are you going to back in the political race? Which side do you want to be counted on? Let's go to the song.
Let's conclude with song number 186. Bring the story to tell to the nation. Number 186. Stand as we sing. Father, we are thankful for one more time being able to come together to share in this faith that we have together and to acknowledge you and praise you. We thank you for the words that you have given us that tell of the life that is coming, that tells of those things that will happen to bring us there. And we pray that we will be attentive to these words, be obedient to your laws, and that we might be found pleasing to you when you send your Son. May that day come soon. Until then, may you be with all of your people who are trying to please you, to guide and protect and comfort and heal. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.